Thank you for joining the webinar for Use Fuel User Reporting for the new elect, uh, online fuels tax system. For those who have applied for access to the test system, you can also follow along at zmsa.odot.state.or.us. When you log on there, you'll get a screen similar to the one shown on uh, your monitor now. Uh, this is access to the test system. If you don't have access to the test system yet, um, we can get you logged on later today also. I'm going to log on with my uh, web demo name. This is the home screen that you'll see each time you log in. I don't currently have a user license for this logon, so I'm going to go through the license application process rather quickly. When you log on to our live system, your user license will already be active, so you won't have to go through the application process. just kind of want to demonstrate briefly how to do it um, in case you do need to update something. I'll go to Account, Registration, and Registration Status. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I just saw a chat note saying call in for sound, so I wasn't sure if that was to me or someone else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm going to go to my account registration, registration status, click on add new record, select use field user um, license on the drop down and insert. I'm going to my license application. And to enter supporting details, I click on the first option. This will give me the option to fill in my storage information and also my supplier. I'm going ahead and add the supplier really quickly here. Oh, I should have done this in Lisa's office. I'm just going to select a terminal name from the drop-down to make it quicker than adding the information. I'm purchasing in bulk from this supplier, and my product code is 170 for biodiesel. You can select your supplier from the drop-down box, or you can add in the address, city, and state. Indicate your purchase type from the drop-down. And then, like I said, biodiesel is product code 170. There are other use field options also. And I'm just going to do the minimum to get my license approved um, for this example. So then I'll go back to my account registrations here and click on my user license again and generate the registration form. Here's where I answer the questions about my business. I'll go into manual entries. It has my um, ownership type for my initial application. Um, we're going to default to monthly reporting for most people, but you may apply quarterly or annual if you have some purchase history. Um, currently in the U.S., uh, my state of organization is Oregon. Okay. I'm going to put uh, this year as the date I was organized. And I can put any state registry number at this point because it's not going to be confirmed for a test case. Um, I'm the primary contact. and the reporting contact you select from the drop-down boxes. The name of, for the spouse and SSN is here if you are a sole proprietor and um, your house, spouse also has access to the account. To go to the next bubble, I can either click on the number here or the navigation arrow at the bottom. On the second bubble, it asks for the location of records. I'm going to use my physical address. If you click Use Physical Address and you don't have a county listed, it will give you an error. If you unclick this box, it will save your information but also allow you to type in a county. If you're registered with the Corporation Division of the Secretary of State, you can click this box and enter your registry information.
and then go on to the next bubble. This asks me for my registered agent if I'm based outside of Oregon and have Oregon operations. And then also for the managing agent, if it's other than someone's already listed on the return. Going to box four, I will check any of these if they apply to my situation. Um, if I own property in Oregon, I can just put my business location. I would put a little more detail on the actual application or anything that wasn't already listed on my locations. Then going to the last field, it asks for any previous use field user licenses. So if you've had a change in ownership or business entity and you had a previous license, you could list that here. If you purchased a business and you can enter who it was purchased from and the date, uh, select your taxpayer contact, your applicant contact and type in your name. Uh, the date signed defaults to the date that you submit it. So I'll go ahead and save my information, and then I'll click on Save and Regenerate to actually create my application form. When it comes back with the uh, one in dark circles and the two through five in light circles, you've completed your application without any critical errors. If you have a white circle, you have information that needs to be addressed. So I'm going ahead and close my application. I can go here to, um, need to refresh my window. And now I can view my application. So I can look at the PDF of the registration form that I've completed based on the boxes I've checked. If there's anything that's incorrect, you can go back into your details and correct that. And I'm going to go ahead and submit this for approval. And then as soon as someone has a chance, they'll get it approved for me. Um, the other thing you may need to do is also um, add new record and apply for use field user emblems. If you're going to be using um, your uh, retail services, then you'll need the emblem to buy X tax fuel. If you have a bulk tank, they're not required. But you can click on the application for use field user emblems also. And insert. And then you can enter the supporting details for this form. There's only one schedule, and that's for emblems. And you'll enter your vehicle information here and insert for each emblem you want to purchase, uh, want to uh, apply for. So I have no clue what a VIN number is, so I'll just put in some random digits here. Fuel type, and this is the information you would put in for an emblem request. When you have all of your vehicles in, they'll be listed here. And as with the useful user license, you can go in and uh, generate the registration form. Save and generate, oops, need manual entries. Oh, I'm applying for 2015. And this will show my emblem uh, request form. You can also use this form if you need to um, in add a vehicle to your existing license. So you're requesting an emblem here. 
Um, if you need to add or change, there, it has a spot for emblem action. You can indicate whether you're adding or deleting. But I see that my license has been approved now, so we can go to tax filing, tax sessions, and we'll add our use field user form. So to file your report, you go to tax filing, tax sessions, and click add new record. We're going to go through the manual entries and then also show you an Excel upload so you see both ways to do it. To add new record, select use field user from the drop -down, third drop down box and then indicate which period you're filing. I have a June 2015 sample ready, even though it's technically late, we'll go ahead and do our reports. And I'm not approved for June. Okay. I guess we'll just do a July report and update our information. <laughs> I must not have been clear in my application when I needed to file. Okay. So we'll go into schedule transactions. And there are five schedules that you can use, or excuse me, six schedules, five are fully functional at this point for a use field user. The 1B is bulk field purchases when you pay tax to your supplier. The 2B is bulk fuel purchases when you do not pay tax to your supplier. The 1UF is tax paid purchases when you per purchase from retail, card lock, or fleet fueling. And the 2UF is X tax purchases when you purchase from card lock, retail, or fleet fueling. Schedule A is a vehicle consumption record, which many of you are probably familiar with, where you put in your odometer readings, any off-road miles, and the fuel used. And there's also a consumption record, but at the time, this time it does not feed into the report. It's mostly available for your information. Um, we I also am aware that we have a variety of types of users involved. So the first example I'm going to show you is for user simplified reporting, where you pay all of your tax on your purchases without any vehicle operations. So I'm going to put in some bulk purchases um, that are X tax. I'm going to select my 2B. I'm going to add new record. My product code is going to be 170 for biodiesel. And I will purchase in July. So I'm doing a July report now. You have to give your tank a name, so I'm going to call this my home tank. And I can select my supplier from the drop down here which includes the several suppliers, or I just know that one of my test companies is Buyer Oil, so I'm just going to use them. If you start typing in the name, it'll complete it for you or give you some to select from. And um, I'll purchase 500 gallons on the 10th. And then later this month, I got a second delivery. Oh, serious same supplier and I'll get 750 gallons this time. You'll note that it saves the fuel type, the date, the tank, and the supplier information. Uh, you need to update the date if necessary and then how many gallons purchased and then click insert. If this is going to a different tank, I would change the tank name when I did my insert function. So now I have two bulk purchases. Um, one 500 gallons, one 750 gallons that went to my bulk tank. But let's say for part of the time I was out of the area, so I needed to do some um, retail purchases also. I'm going to go down to my 1UF and say I bought at a station without my emblem, so they charged me tax. So I'm still buying diesel. July. The purchase type this time is going to be retail. If I had card lock or fleet fueling, I could put those in as well. 
The invoice number is going to be on the receipt that I got from the station, but since I don't have it, I'm going to make one up. And then I've got 35 gallons. And of course, I had to get back from my little trip here, so I'll make another retail purchase the next day. And head home. Now this is a somewhat simplistic example just to show you how it works for a user simplified report where you're paying tax on all of your fuel. When I have my two retail purchases, and in this case, I can go back and look at my two bulk purchases. I can go to tax filing, tax sessions, select my user report, and go into session details. On the session details, I'm going to click include schedules so that I can see all of, all of the schedules that I'm completing. And in the manual entries, I'm going to select option one. On simplified reporting, all fuel is 100% used in a taxable manner. And then I'm going to generate my return. I'm going to go ahead and refresh the view now. Click on my user report and view the tax return. In this view, you can see that I purchased 77 gallons at retail, 1,250 in bulk. Oh, it's okay. I um, emailed. For a total of 1,327. The box is clicked here showing that I'm doing simplified reporting. They're going to deduct the 77 gallons that were tax paid, and I will pay tax on the 1,250 gallons that I had purchased X tax and delivered to my home tank. So my tax due in this case would be $375. If I had purchased this fuel um, tax paid from my supplier, then I would have no tax due. It would be an information report. Here's my bulk schedule showing my two bulk purchases and my retail schedule showing my retail purchases. And that's all you need if you're a user simplified reporter. You can return to your tax sessions, click on your line, and go ahead and file your tax return. Since I'm going to show you some other examples, I'm not going to file this return yet. But I'm going to go back into my scheduled transactions. Were there any questions on simplified reporting? I have one. Okay. Um, when you did the 77 gallons, mm -hmm. do I have to include a copy of the invoice to prove that I paid taxes on those 77? Yes, you will be including copies of the invoices. Um, currently, that function isn't totally up to date in this version. Um, you go into session details, and you can either scan um, and attach, because you will be able to go to supporting documents and be able to add a record here. So if you want to scan them in, or um, you can, re if we, until this is functional, you can retain copies and we'll request them if needed. Okay. But yeah, you will be able to scan them in and attach them through supporting documents, or you can fax them over to us also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to unclick my option one while I'm here. And I'm going to go back into my schedule transactions. And I'm going to leave my bulk purchases alone um, because I want to demonstrate now a government uh, option. But I am going to take away my tax paid retail, so I'll just get rid of those real quick. And this is how easy it is to remove something that you do by accident. You can delete a transaction, go back in and fix it, or you can update it. Um, next, I want to show an example of government reporting. Most of their purchases will be X tax. So in this case, um, looking at bulk purchases, I, put, I still have my two bulk purchases in on 2B. 
I know a lot of my uh, government entities also have card lock accounts so that they can pay just one time, not have to worry about sending cash with drivers. And so we're going to go the 2UF for our X tax purchases and put in some card lock transactions. So I'm going to add new record. And I'll put in my product code 170. My purchase date can be any time during the month. My purchase type is going to be card lock. It could just as easily be fleet fueling. My invoice number, I'm billed once a month, so I'm going to call this card lock invoice uh, 2015-07. And this time I'll purchase 26 gallons. And insert. Note that it will keep the product code, the date, and the purchase type. So I just need to update my date for my next purchase. My invoice number is still the same. And this time I'll get 29 gallons. And I will continue with my card lock transactions. until I have them all in. I'm going to do a couple more here for demonstration. Now I have um, five card lock transactions, and I've noticed that I put the same gallons in twice. Um, that was an error, so I couldn't read the handwriting on this one receipt. So I'll go ahead and change this, should be 27, and then I can update that transaction. And it could be that I had two vehicles purchasing the exact, exact same gallons on different days, or the same vehicle on different days. But looking back on the invoice that I'm entering from here, I realized that it should have been 27 and 33. So I'm going to go back now to my tax sessions. When we looked at the schedules, we had five card lock transactions and two bulk transactions. We're going to go into session details again. We still have our schedules included. We're going to go into manual entry and uncheck this box and check the box for government reporting. And then save and generate. Close this. We'll refresh the view. And this time we'll look at our user report. We'll view tax return. Good. And it shows that we purchased 137 gallons X tax from Cardlock, the same 1,250 that we got from the bulk tank. We've got the government box checked, and there's no tax due, so we filed our information report for government tax. Again, our uh, schedules show our bulk purchases and the card lock purchases. So we can return to tax sessions, click on the month, and file the tax return. So were there any questions about government reporting? Yes. OK. Um, do we need to put the vehicles, uh, the list of vehicles on there? If all of your vehicles are e-plated, registered to a government entity, you do not need to put the vehicle schedules on your report. You should retain them for audit purposes if we need to, you know, like you would your maintenance records, so we have mileage at the beginning of each quarter or year, depending on what your uh, reporting period is. 
but you don't have to provide them with your report. So um, with the government, will we be able to do this annually like I have been? If you're currently an annual user, you'll be able to continue to file annually. Oh, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who would I call to find out if I can do it, um, change from monthly to annually? Um, you can call our main line. It's 503-378-8150. And we can review your reporting history and find out whether you qualify for monthly, quarterly, or annual reporting. Most government agencies can either file quarterly or annually. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go ahead and do a quick data file upload to erase all my schedules. Um, and this is kind of the cheater's way to clean it up, but that way we can start from scratch because I want to show you how to do an Excel upload. Actually, let's start this way. Um, if you're going to uh, upload a file from Excel, and this would come in handy if you have a lot of purchases, uh, if you can just copy and paste your card lock into the Excel form instead of having to do all the entries, um, or if you're filing with Schedule A, which is our vehicle operations, you may find it easier um, to do an Excel upload. I will show you, before we do this, I'll show you the vehicle operation schedule. So if we go into our schedule transactions, let's look at our schedule A for vehicles so we know what information we're looking for. This is similar to the vehicle schedule that you would have filled out to calculate gallons, but it'll do all the math for you now. So if you add new record, you look for product code, Again, that's of the 170. Uh, see, I got a license uh, for my XVP443 was the plate number I used for my emblem. It'll be 2015 something. I'll just say 1234 for now. And let's say my beginning odometer reading, um, put some numbers in and, or excuse me, that's my ending rating, my beginning If I had any out-of-state miles or off-road miles or had reported to motor carrier, I could enter those. Uh, if I had student transportation for this vehicle, which I don't, I would enter it here. And then I would calculate the fuel used for this vehicle for the month um, using my bulk uh, tank consumption records, my card lock, my retail, and put, that, put those gallons in here. And then insert. And then when I did the Schedule A, it would calculate the fuel used. Um, well, I, I know I used 25 gallons, so in this case, with no other deductions, it would just charge me the 25 gallons. A lot of work, poor guys. Mission gets a lot of work. But for our tax sessions, I'm going to go in um, and show you yeah. how to do a data upload. I'm sick, still blocked. We'll have to go so, get that opened yeah. up. Uh, you click on the line. Go to data file upload. Each side. And, then, uh, and in the gray area, you can click on download template. We're going to have to get a crack by hand. Open it. And this will bring up the blank template for entering your information in Excel. I'll come help as soon as this is done. All right. Um, you'll have your schedule code here. So the one A. Uh, the 1B for tax paid bulk, the 2B for X tax bulk, the 1 US, the 2 US, the A, you put your schedule code. Your product will usually be 170. It could be um, B20 or if you have propane or CNG. Uh, the invoice date is either from your invoice or your um, bill of lading. For your mileage records on Schedule A, you just use the last day of the month. So the uh, gallons purchased. Uh, the supplier's uh, ID type, which is either federal ID number, FEIN, or SSN. That seller number, their legal name. When you're having vehicle information, you'll have the beginning odometer reading, the emblem number, the ending odometer reading, and uh, any off-road miles, uh, motor carrier miles, other deductions, or miles driven out of state.
when you have deliveries to a bulk tank, you might have information on um, the tank number or name and tank inventory readings. The information you need for each schedule is under the schedule requirements. So for each of these schedules, for the 1B, you're required to have a schedule, well, all schedules are required to have a schedule code and a product type and voice date. And then um, for each other schedule, you'll figure out what the requirements are from this list. The schedule list tells you what each schedule is and what you're to report. The product codes that are applicable, again, propane, kerosene, an undefined product, um, diesel, biodiesel, CNG, LNG, uh, B20 made from used cooking oil. And then there are some definitions um, for card lock, fleet fueling, and retail. There isn't too much that's big, really, on the uh, user form. But I am going to save this. And then when I select this file to uh, upload, it'll basically blank out my form because it has nothing in the templates. So I'm going to refresh my view here and then view my return to make sure it's empty. Whoops, not yet. So now if I look at transaction validation, it should tell me there are no records to display. This tells me that my return is empty. I'm starting with a clean slate. So I go back to tax sessions, and this time I'm going to upload a template with information. I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, this template is for June, so I need to change all my dates to July. Can you use find and replace if you have to do something like that? I think you can, but usually you would be filling this out um, when you were do preparing your report. It's just that I had prepared a June sample um, for today, and my license wasn't valid till July, so all of my stuff is a month too early. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would ha that's what happens when you try to be prepared and then, yeah, something doesn't quite go right. I know that feeling. And then all of these are ending meter readings, so I can just go ahead and copy this. Fortunately, I don't have a lot of transactions in this file, or this could take longer. Um, so basically what this shows is that I have two bulk purchases that are X-Tax, one going um, to my, um, over here, and these are both going to my main tank. I have five purchases that are X tax from Card Lock. And again, it has my Card Lock uh, number and the Card Lock designation here. I also have one purchase that is tax paid. Again, same supplier, tax paid purchase of 1,000 gallons that I said went to my fleet tank. Go all the way over here. So that's something that I use for fleet, you know, for my uh, vehicles that are subject to tax. And then I've got four vehicles listed on my Schedule A. So for those four vehicles, here's the gallons that I calculated that they've used this month. Their odometer readings, the emblem numbers, and then in this area there's any out-of-state miles, off-road miles, motor carrier miles. So this is what my file looks like when I put it in Excel. And like I said, normally you'd be doing this during the current month so you wouldn't have to go back and change the dates because you get it right the first time. So I'll go ahead and save this so we can upload it. 
go back to the system. I'll collect, select um, use field user monthly. Go to my data file upload. Click select. Even though it says June, I know it's really a July template now. Open that and then click on upload. It tells me that my user template has been successfully uploaded. So I'll click on the line, go into my session details. I'm going to tell it to include schedules. And in manual entry, I'm not going to select anything because I'm using Schedule A for my vehicle activities. So I will have none of the boxes checked here, and I want to save and regenerate. It tells me here my return generation request was made. So I can close this window. I'll go ahead and refresh the view. And now I'm going to look in transaction validation. Anytime you do an Excel upload, you want to make sure that all your transactions came over. So I'm going to look at transaction validation. And it's going to tell me that 11 of my transactions passed, one of them failed. In this section, it tells me that it was a critical error that I need to fix to file. Um, and it was on my line 12 for my Schedule A. If I click on this line, it'll bring up the manual entry screen for that schedule. And in this case, it was, it's a missing emblem number for my motor carrier vehicle. And I don't have an emblem for my motor carrier vehicle because I can purchase x tax fuel with my motor carrier plate. So I'm going to go ahead and type in my motor carrier plate again. <coughs> in place of my emblem number, because this is a valid ODOT ID, and click Update. It tells me that my record is updated. I can close this window. And now all my transactions have passed validation. I'll go back to tax filing, tax sessions. Click on refresh. And then click on this line and view my tax return. It still says it needs to be regenerated, okay. I think I'm missing a column here to view. There we go. Now I can generate. Now it's past validation. I can go ahead and view my question. Was that a train? I'm in a quiet room. <laughs> I, I do apologize. I'm out by the airport. <laughs> it's a National well, don't, Guard. Don't they know they should wait till we're done? Yeah. <laughs> Put it on hold. I've got a conference call. Um, I am sorry. That's okay. Um, there was a way I, I, don't, I don't know how to mute it, so. It's kind of hard. To, some of them work on mute and some of them don't, but thanks for trying. Okay. Um, now when I view my tax return, it shows that I purchased 137 gallons from Cardlock, 2,250 from Bulk for a total of 2,387. My taxable gallons are 2,281. I've purchased 1,000 gallons tax paid, so I have 1,281 uh, taxable gallons and total amount due of 384.30. Looking at my schedules, here's my 1,000 gallons, uh, my one taxable purchase of 1,000 gallons. My two X tax purchases. My card lock purchases. And then the last page it shows me is my Schedule A. If you have filed the vehicle consumption records before, you're probably familiar with looking at these. It has the plate number, the emblem number, product code, 
um, the odometer readings. It'll do the math for you to tell you how many miles you went. Um, this truck was out of state for 1,500 miles. Uh, this one had off-road miles. My F plate had off-road miles. Uh, my Y plate reported half of its mileage to motor carrier. The other half was apparently empty. I put in the um, <coughs> total fuel used for each vehicle. It calculates the MPG and the gallons that are subject to tax based on the mileage and the usage. So this is the total. Oh, that's not a total on that page. But that's where the 2,281 taxable gallons came for from option four. So that shows that it's using Schedule A. This is my last example for the users. So we're going to return to tax sessions, and this time we'll file our report. So I'll click on the line and go ahead and file tax return. I'm going to agree to my submittal and submit. It shows I owe $29,000 because every, all the other payments are pending, but for this one it was $354.30, so I'm going to type that in. This is one of the few times you can override the amount due is if you have pending payments for other reports. So I'll submit. be greater than or equal to the amount due. What did I? 384.30. Oh, 384.30. Okay. I can't read my gray lines very well. And I don't remember what I said five minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> now let's submit. Okay. Now it's accepting it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pay this on the due date, which will be 8-20-2015. So I'll submit. And I'm going to show this as a one-time payment so I can show you the payment setup. We'll click Submit here. Now this is taking us to the U.S. Bank site, and their secure site holds all of your account information. It does not actually show up in the fuel tax system. So this shows how much payment I'm going to make, the due date it's coming out, and the tracking number. I can pay now or pay on the future date. If I click pay now, it'll actually come out on 820 because that's what I asked it to do. I'm going to enter a new payment account to show that process. You put in your bank routing number. and your bank account number. I indicate whether it's checking or savings and click continue. It's telling me I have a payment pending. So. <laughs> You'll get the confirmation screen. So I'm going to accept the terms and conditions and confirm my payment request. I'll get a confirmation number. That's ODOT, state tax. If this was a recurring payment, I'd have an R here. And then my number, my uh, random digit number to uh, indicate my payment. The amount paid, uh, the payment, the date the payment was initiated, and that it is currently scheduled. Click continue. And then it'll take me to my payment history screen. And my payment history shows all of the pending payments I have going. They all show one time. What if you want to set up a recurring payment, you can go to account management. Payment Processing Setup, you can select your account, and if you put this in as a recurring payment when they asked you whether it was one time or recurring, then you can do this. You can click on your account information, and again, we don't actually have your account details here, it just shows that you're registered with the U.S. Bank. 
You can select auto pay, yes or no. If you select yes, you can select the due date, whether you want it on the due date of the report, one up to five days before, or immediately on completing the return. I'll do it one day before. And then you can update your information. Now, each time I file a report it, and I select recurring payment, it'll automatically come from this account on the day before the due date. If you have a change in your account information, you can also go here. And say you want to update your U.S. bank payment details. And it'll take you back to the U.S. bank website to set up additional account information or modify the accounts you have. So here's my basic contact information, my payment methods. I have a couple of accounts set up here. I can edit or delete those or add a new account. So if you have different accounts you know, for uh, different operations, scheduled payments, it shows the pending payments I have here for today, and the recurring payment for my prior report. And my payment history, everything should be pending. Oh, I do have one that paid yesterday, okay. So I have one payment that's processed. And then I can exit, or if I've made changes, I can also update. So I'm just gonna go ahead and exit the US Bank screen because I'm not going to change anything else. Uh, a lot of times you'll come back to our home screen if your information still shows here, you're still logged in, you can go back to your tax filing and tax sessions. And now I can go, uh, when I look at my report history, my seller monthly has a tracking number, excuse me, my user monthly has a tracking number. And um, if I look at my other columns, it'll have a file date. Okay, I do have a file date, that's today. So it has a tracking number and file date showing this return has been submitted. Do I have questions on Excel uploads, Schedule A payments? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, you're faint, but I can hear you. Okay, um, we have over 150 trusts. And the majority of them, I'd say 90% or more, are commercial. And okay. when I was kind of watching um, your import, I still have to key that because right now I just um, I move beginning to ending to beginning the next month. But every month I'm going to have to rekey all this stuff again. Um, Not save. Um, most of the t I believe that the ending odometer readings will come up as the beginning for the next month. If and you can set up a template like if you if this was your Excel template for your vehicles, um you could have all your vehicles listed first and you could just take the last month, copy the ending meter reading into the the beginning from one month or the ending from one month into the beginning of the next and only have to enter the ending and you can, you know, you would still have your emblem numbers and a lot of your vehicle information here. You just need to change the date and the gallons. And you have to tell it where the gallons came, what location the gallons came from, because we have um, six operations in Oregon. You have what? Really have, do you have to tell where what tank the gallons came from? So if you're purchasing fuel, purchasing fuel out of state? No, I guess I, would, I was kind of watching you. It looked like I had to tell you where you have your total gallons of fuel used. I had to tell you what tank that came no, um, for the total fuel used for each fleet item, you don't have to tell us which tank it came from, because okay. this is just these are the purchases up here, and okay. that's that's where the purchases went to. But yeah, my total gallons here, it does not say which tank it came from. Okay. okay. You still need to keep consumption records for your tank for audit purposes, but you're not required to report them at this time. Oh. So that schedule of inventories were not that schedule of were not given. I'm sorry, there was some background noise. Is this is the schedule B part of this import then too? 
At this point, it isn't. It's not fully functional. We do plan to incorporate that so that you can keep your tank inventory readings and it'll carry over. But right now, the um, it isn't calculating the beginning and in the fuel used from the Schedule B yet. That is an enhancement that we do have plan to have in the future. But at this point, we're just asking how much fuel you purchased and how much you used. Okay, great. You'll still retain the consumption records, you know, in the event of an audit. But at this point, you're not re reporting them. I have a question on payment. Mm -hmm. Is there another option besides the auto pay? Is there like credit card payment option? Uh, we do not accept credit cards at this point. Um, we don't have authority to either charge a fee for using them or to absorb the fee, and that's part of the issue. Um, that is something that we're looking at, but currently we're not allowed to accept credit cards. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. I came in a little late. So we need to go, do we need to go and do June? So we haven't, like we did with the seller returns, do we have to do uh, June? June? Yeah, you don't need to file a June report for users because there's not any in inventory that will carry over at this point. Okay. Um, if you want to, I mean, uh, anybody who wants to have access to the test system at ZMSA, I think most of you have um, logons for the test system. We encourage you to go ahead and apply for a user license. I'll be checking periodically to see if there are any. You can use this test system to practice filing your reports until you get it the way you want it. And then um, you can actually export the report from the practice system and upload it to the live system when you're ready. But you know, this gives you a chance to practice. You can select almost any month. Most of the time when I approve licenses, I'll approve it back to January 2015, so that gives you several months or quarters to test with if you want to. But it gives you a chance to become familiar with the system before you start using the live system. Emblem numbers stay with the uh, plate number throughout the, pro throughout the life There's of the stay. vehicle. The emblem numbers, they usually change every year because they're issued for an annual basis. But it's usually just, uh, we try to keep the emblem number the same. Like if I renewed this vehicle in 2016, it would likely be a 2016 one, two, three, four. So I could just change this number here when I renewed the emblem. Okay, is that a change you would make, or is that a change that we could make? Um, you would, when you get your new emblems each year, they'll they'll be on there. But like I said, usually the last digits of the emblem number are the same, so you just have to change the year, and you can change it on your template. And you know when you get your new emblems. Okay. What is it? Any other questions on user reporting? Okay, if we don't have any more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and close this session of the webinar. I wanna thank you all for participating. Um, if you have things that come up when you're trying to use a test system and trying to figure out how things work, um, please give us a call or send us an email and let us know what you're running up against and we can help you figure that out. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Linda. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome.